Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Cyclical Investors Club YouTube channel. My name is Corey Kramer, and today we're going to be analyzing automatic data processing, ticker ADP. This one came in by request down in the comments section of one of my other videos. If you have a request you'd like me to take a look at, um, if it's a stock that's in the S&P 500, I post those on YouTube for free, and the rest I post over on Patreon and in the, cyclical, the full Cyclical Investors Club service on Seeking Alpha. Um, I have free tiers for both of those services now, along with the paid tiers, so they're worth um, checking out. I'll have those links down in the description. And then if you join the $5 tier at Patreon, you can request stocks that are not in the S&P 500, and you can also get a big discount if you ever decide to join the full Cyclical Investors Club service over on Seeking Alpha. Um, and there I have all the spreadsheets. You can chat with me. Um, pretty much any time. I have, I don't know, like hundreds of articles at this point. Um, I've been writing over on Seeking Alpha for since 2015, so this is my ninth year, and to, and full time since 2018. So I don't know, we're like on six, year six or seven there. Uh, so I have lots of stuff over there, but you can kind of gradually work your way in. Usually on the free tiers, I over on Patreon, I've been posting occasionally some stuff on like book chapters and thoughts and investing books and things like that um, that I haven't yet been posting on the YouTube channel here so I also have a 25% off affiliate link down in the description for fast graphs if you think this graphic service um, it might be useful to you you can check those out down there and get if you've never used it before you can get um, a discount if you use the link that's down there um, I've been using it for a long time uh, I don't think I started in 2015. It was a little closer to like maybe 2018. So I've been using it five or six years now. And for the style of investing that I use, that especially the earnings-based stuff, um, it's very, very useful to sift through stocks um, quickly. I have some videos on that here on the channel um, where I show you how fast you can go through and just kind of rule out a bunch of stocks and kind of really winnow things down um, to kind of a manageable number just by using fast graphs looking at the historical earnings and being like okay that fits with what i'm doing that doesn't um so it can be useful in that regard and i'll use it in this video today as always uh this is not individual investing advice this is just how i analyze stocks so adp is going to be a good one to look at because i think it pretty much is a good proxy for the entire s p 500 in terms of like valuation at this point um they are employment kind of related so um you know if unemployment rate goes up or businesses medium small businesses um if they you know fail or go out of business um, or shrink you know then that probably you know would affect adp's business as well so they kind of reflect the real economy they also reflect kind of the stock market and when I looked at the valuation, it was basically kind of right in the middle of where the S&P 500 is. And so I think it's, and it's pretty easy to analyze. So this would be a good one if you're just kind of new and you're trying to figure out all this stuff to take a look at because it's uh, pretty straightforward. There's not like really much debt to deal with. So you can kind of like ignore that. Um, and if you look at the earnings, which is this dark green area here on the fast graph, they're very steady and so they don't fluctuate a lot and they're very pretty straightforward they had a small decline back in 2004 it looks like coming out of that recession a very small decline in earnings per share coming out of the great recession in terms of earnings growth other than that it basically grows they've been growing earnings every year not always very fast but always consistent so that makes it easy easier you never know what's going to happen in the future but it makes it easier to to kind of forecast that earnings trend out into the future so if we go since 2016 we can see the earnings growth rate i didn't I've, i didn't double check to see how much stock they they actually buy back they probably are buying back some stock too um but we'll just set that aside for now i'll i take it in, i took it into consideration on my earnings growth rate but you can look at like 13 percent, 13 percent, 20 20 this was a tax cut year, so that might have influenced that, but he still had good growth. And it was probably split between the two years because their fiscal year is halfway through the year. Um, so that might be a little larger than you would normally expect. And then COVID, a little smaller than we would normally expect. And then we kind of have some teens 
growth the past couple years, and they're expecting like eight or nine percent growth for the earnings growth the next couple years. So on the fast graph, we're looking at thirteen point six seven percent earnings growth during this period. Let me see what I have real quick. Eleven seven four. So that's probably because they bought some stock back, and I take that into consideration. I almost I also might go from twenty fifteen. Nope, twenty sixteen. Okay, yeah, so I'm a little bit more conservative um, than the fast graph, but definitely like right in the ballpark in terms of my earnings growth expectation. It's worth noting that analysts are not expecting it to grow at 11 to 13 percent. Um, they're expecting eight or nine, but sometimes they kind of sandbag that a little bit so they can beat it. And so that really is, I think 11 is a very fair, 11, 12 percent earnings growth expectation is a fair estimate. Um, because I'm going to extrapolate that out 10 years into the future. So you're gonna we've had some pretty positive year things happen with stimulus, with tax cuts. Those things are probably not not necessarily going to happen over the next 10 years and there also wasn't really a real recession this time. So rather than going with 13 or 14 percent, to me it makes more sense to be closer to like that 11. Um, and a person would be perfectly justified going with like eight or nine, I think. But we have more inflation, and these guys can definitely pass that cost on. So the nominal return might be higher than what it has been in the past, all other things being equal. Um, and that's one of the benefits of owning a quality business that can pass those costs on. But it also might mean that they actually can grow at a faster nominal rate than what people expect right now. Because if we have higher inflation than we had during this last period, um, they should be able to grow their earnings more the only exception to that would be if it all came from like an energy price spike in that case it would hurt more business the number of more businesses it would hurt would be higher um, obviously energy related businesses would benefit but all the other businesses would not so so that's some that's maybe an exception when it comes to the inflation if that's where the inflation comes from um, okay, so yeah, let's just get into, okay, so they're expected to earn $9.16 this year, and this year's almost over for them, so they probably just have one more quarter to report. So that'll probably be relatively accurate, would be my guess. Um, and then I had that 11.74% earnings growth rate expectation. So the way I calculate that is, um, that works out to about a 26.47 PE, um, only a tiniest adjustment for debt. So a 3.7% um, earnings yield. So the earnings yield is the inverse of the PE ratio. PE ratio is price over earnings. Earnings yield is ye earnings over price. And then that will come out as a, well, in this case, it's a decimal, but it's a percentage. Um, and so the way I like to think about that is you take that 3.7%. And so if you bought this whole business for $100, you would earn, and so when you saw that switch right there, that's the price, it would have dropped a little bit. And as the price drops, for every $100 that you buy of the business, you get a little bit more earnings, so you got an extra penny of earnings from whatever the price just dropped, because this updates in real, close to real time. Um, so you get that $3.71 in earnings on your $100, and it would grow at the estimated 11.74% or so. Um, and so I pull the first year forward. So the first year, I assume you're going to get $4.14 on your $100. And what I want to know is how much could I collect over 10 years on my $100. So that's what the spreadsheet does. Um, and with those assumptions, you could collect about $171.77 on your initial $100 investment. So if you plug that into a Kager calculator over a 10 year period, should get something that's about 5.56% earnings kager, like a business owner's earnings type of kager. If you watch any of my other videos, you've been you've heard me say like probably 100 times, the S&P 500 10 year kager is about 5.5%. Um, and so this is pretty much spot on with that. So you can see how, you know, without, there's not really anything fancy going on here with this analysis, I mean, we didn't, there, there might have been a little bit of share buybacks that they were doing, but um, other than that, you just have what are you paying for earnings, how much are you expecting them to grow, over what time period are you going to measure, 
my time period was 10 years, earnings growth rate was 11.74%, and the earnings yield started at 3.71%. And you just run the numbers. And so this is where you come out to. Now, cash is yielding what, like, it might be a little less than 5.3%, 5.2%. So, but that's short term, that can change, right? Whereas this is a longer 10 year kind of estimate. Um, so the question is, okay, each individual investor has to say, well, what um, are you willing to pay? Like what kind of return do you want? If an investor is happy with this um, kind of a 5.5% return, probably inflation, like inflation proof, sort of in most cases. So you get a little inflation hedge, but you're gonna have to accept volatility and you have to deal with the fact that maybe they're not gonna grow at 11%, maybe they grow at something less than that. Um, compared to like a bond where what you have to worry about is the opposite in many ways, you have to worry about what inflation is because if your return is a fixed rate and inflation ends up being higher than that, and then you don't really make any money. Um, so they aren't comp they are not comparable when you compare like a 10 year treasury to this yield here in that sense, you really need to understand kind of the benefits of each. So if we had a really bad recession, maybe their earnings growth comes in much less than this and the bond rate is still going to be the same. And because there's a recession, we don't, maybe we have deflation instead of inflation. Well, that's when the bonds look good. Um, and so you kind of want to have a little bit of a view on that. Mine is that the odds of inflation are higher. If there is a recession, I have some cash set aside and that cash is earning me like 5.3% right now. Um, but when I find a stock that I think will yield 8% or more, then I'm willing to come in and buy it. So this isn't at eight, like um, 6.5 is kind of my mid range for fair value. So the price would need to fall a little bit to get to there, probably down to like 200 bucks a share would probably be roughly fair value. I can, I can actually look at it here. I can just type in 200 and see almost exactly right. So um, so about $200 a share is probably fair value here. And then to buy it, you're going to be more down around 150 to 140. The 140 is my recession buy price. Um, they, do, they don't really, it falls a little bit, like the multiple compresses a little bit during recessions, but not that much. I think during the Great Recession, it got down under a 15 PE, but that's not like super cheap. That's just kind of normal most of the time. Um, so there's not much difference between the regular buy price and the recession buy price, like 10 bucks or something. Um, and you could probably come in at 150 and be just fine if the price falls that far. But the recession buy price can kind of be good because if these earnings fail to come in, so they, this year is probably locked in, but and I'll adjust this next year. So they're expected to earn almost $10 a share next year but maybe there's a recession and they only earn eight bucks a share, right? Well, the recession PE um, won't get any lower than this. It won't drop. Whereas if the earnings and the earnings growth start declining, then the normal buy price would keep getting lower and lower. It might actually get lower than this 140 for the recession PE if there was really a recession going on. And so the recession PE serves to kind of both keep me from buying too early during a downturn if I think there's risk of one. And since interest rates are so high, I kind of do. Um, and then, uh, but it also, as if earnings really do deteriorate, then the recession PE is becomes more optimistic, right? Um, and so it, it adds a little bit of stability because it assumes that the stock will recover, that the earnings will recover within a couple of years and that it can be back on track. That's the underlying assumption behind the kind of the recession buy price. But yeah, like that 140 mark is probably what I would aim for to get like um, a margin of safety, a really good deal, you know, assuming their business isn't being disrupted or something like that. Assuming it's just like a normal recession type of a thing. So that's my analysis of uh, ADP. If you have a request, drop it down in the comment section. If you found this video useful, hit the subscribe button. I've been putting out like five videos a week or something like that uh, pretty steadily and I plan to keep doing that. And then, and then if, um, if you like the video, give it a like. Uh, thanks for watching. I'll see everybody later. Bye.